Hi everyone, so today we're going to discuss about functional inequalities. So you might have seen functional equations, right? For example, um, f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y, this famous Cauchy, Cauchy's functional equation. But um, in many cases, we have to solve for functional inequalities, where instead of an equation, we are given an inequality, right? And this is a particular question of functional inequalities. And um, functional inequalities as a topic, it became very famous in the recent year because IMO 2022 problem number two was actually functional inequality. It was a very small, it was a very elegant question of functional inequalities, but it was something very cool, right? So in this video, we're going to be see how we can solve certain functional inequalities. So yeah, let's begin. This is a question from the Vietnam Math Olympiad, VMO. And uh, in this video, we're going to be looking at how we can solve certain functional inequalities, what's the substitution strategy, the core perspective of solving a functional inequality is still the same. You can still go for substitution strategies. You can still try proving the functions as injective, surjective, bijective, etc. So essentially, a lot of the things you know are retained. A lot of the things are similar. And then we obviously have book sessions for National Math Olympiads, and at the end, a similar level challenging problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical olympiads, physics olympiads, computer science and informatics olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, so we need to find all functions f uh, defined on reals to reals such that for all reals x comma y it satisfies this given equation. Right, so this is actually very fascinating. Um, how do we go about this? So first thing to notice is that y and z are symmetric, right? What does it mean? That essentially means that if I replace y with z and z with y, I'll still get the same thing. And another thing to notice that they are symmetric is you have always have the product y z, right? And you have y over here and z over here multiplied by x. So it doesn't matter if there is y or z, you can replace them. You can replace y with z and z with x, you'll still get the same, same thing on the left hand side. That means that y and z are symmetric. But, but x comma y comma z is not symmetric, right? So all three are not symmetric. So if I replace x with y, y with z and z with x, I'll not get the same thing that we had in the original question. Now, why is this important? This is important because this is going to motivate the substitution strategies that we're going to use, right? Now, because y and z are symmetric, I'm going to substitute y and z by the same number and I'm going to substitute x by a different number, right? So let's just start off with substituting y is equal to z is equal to 1. Again, same substitution because they are symmetric, right? That would potentially lead to some better simplifications than if you choose some other values, some separate values for y and z. So I chose y is equal to z is equal to 1. It's a good starting point. And I chose x is equal to x. Let's just try that and see where we go. So you will get um, half times f of x plus f of x over here. And uh, here you'll get f of x times f of 1, which is greater than or equal to 1 by 4. So that means that f of x minus f of x times f of 1 is greater than or equal to 1 by 4. That essentially implies that f of x times 1 minus f of 1 is going to be greater than or equal to 1 by 4. Now over here, I'm just going to use the substitution x equals to 1. So I'll get f of 1 times 1 minus f of 1 is um, greater than or equal to 1 by 4. Or even in the original question, you could have just substituted 1, 1, 1 for all three and still have arrived at this at the same result. But okay, now how can we figure this out? So if you actually notice, all we have is f of 1 on the left hand side. So we just open this out, you'll get f of 1 minus f of 1 whole squared is greater than or equal to 1 by 4. Or in other words, I can write f of 1 whole squared minus f of 1 plus 1 by 4 is less than or equal to 0. Right, just making f of 1 as in a way a subject and forming like a quadratic kind of a structure over here. Now, if I just let f of 1 is equal to t, I'll form t squared minus t plus 1 by 4 is less than or equal to 0. But this can very easily be factorized as t minus 1 whole squared is less than or equal to 0. But, you know, any squared quantity x squared is always greater than or equal to 0. But here we are seeing that a squared quantity is less than or equal to 0. That essentially implies that the quantity has to be 0. Right? 
What I'm trying to say is that we know for a fact that a squared quantity x square will always be greater than or equal to zero. But if for some particular reason x square is less than or equal to zero, that implies that x equal to zero. It can never be less than zero. That's the essential point, right? So similarly, over here, t minus one whole square can never be less than zero. So it obviously has to be equal to zero. So that implies that t is equal to one by two. But what was t? t was essentially f of one, right? So therefore, f of one is equal to one by two, and that's very fascinating. Now, I'm just going to label this as equation number one, right? F of x times this one minus f of one. I'm just going to label that as equation number one. Why? Because I'm going to use this result in equation one. I right? use this result in equation one, and when I do that, I'll get f of x times one minus one half is greater than or equal to one by four. Which implies that f of x times one half is greater than or equal to one by four, or in other words, f of x is greater than or equal to one half for all x belongs to real numbers. Very fascinating, and I'm going to mark that as equation number two. So till now we've received this result, and we can't stop here, okay? Because even though it's a functional inequality, at the end of the day, we need to find the function f. You can't just define the range of the function, right? We effectively need to find the function f. Okay, okay, great. So now what I'm going to do is in the original inequality, I'm just going to plug in x equals to x and y is equal to z is equal to zero. So again, using the fact that y and z are symmetric, we'll use the same substitution for both of them. And um, when I do this, I'll get half times f of zero plus f of zero, right? Minus f of x times f of zero is greater than or equal to one by four, right? And again, over here, I'll get um, f of zero times minus f of x times f of zero is greater than or equal to one by four or i can just factorize out this f of zero and i'll be left with one minus f of x is greater than or equal to one by four now here if i plug in x equals to zero right here i'll get f of zero into one minus f of zero is greater than or equal to one by four again let's say i use f of zero is equal to a so again a times one minus a is greater than or equal to one minus one by four do you notice certain similarities i hope you do because over here as well we'll get a square minus a plus one by four is less than or equal to zero that implies that a minus one whole square is less than or equal to zero which you know by a similar argument like we used before a minus one half needs to be equal to zero which implies a is actually one half. But what was a? A was f of zero. So f of zero is equal to one half, right? So till now we have two very potent results. One is f of one is one half, and the other one I believe is uh, f of zero is also one half. Fascinating, right? Now um, I'll actually label this as uh, equation number three, right? Because I'm going to use that. Now if I just use this result. Uh, in equation number three, what will I get? I'll get half times uh, one minus f of x. This thing was greater than or equal to one by four, right? So we get this over here. That essentially implies that one minus f of x is greater than or equal to one by two. So therefore, f of x minus one is less than or uh, equal to, I believe, negative one by two. Just multiplying by negative. So that implies that f of x is less than or equal to one half. And I'll label that as equation number four. But do you, do you actually notice something? Do you actually notice something? Over here from equation two, we had received f of x is greater than one half. Right? So, but from equation two, f of x is greater than one half for all x belongs to real numbers. But in equation number four, we have f of x less than one half for all x belongs to real numbers. So at one time I'm saying that some number k is greater than or equal to one half. On other on another case I'm saying that k is less than or equal to one half. What does that mean? That implies that k is indeed equal to one half, right? So therefore f of x is indeed equal to one half. So the only function that satisfies this given inequality is the constant function f of x equals to one by two, and that is the end of our question. So yeah, like I said, it was as simple as that. We really did not delve into a lot of complications over there. There's some simple ideas, some simple substitution strategies, noticing that y and z are symmetric, which leads to similar substitutions for the pair. And um, slowly, very slowly, we build it up the we built up the solution, right? 
So really hope you learned something from that. And now you can go on and practice certain functional inequalities of your own. Okay, so we have some book sessions for National Math Olympiads, Elementary Number Theory by David Burton, Problem Solving Strategies by Arthur Angel, Functional Equations by Venkatachala, Problems in Plain Geometry by Sharigin, Elementary Number Theory by Sierpinski, Graph Theory by Harari, and Combinatrix by Brualdi. Okay, so at the end, you have a similar challenging problem, and this is the IMO problem that I was referring to at the beginning of the video. And this is a little bit more challenging, obviously. This is also a functional inequality, but it's slightly more challenging, right? So we need to find all functions f mapping from positive reals to positive reals such that for each x that belongs to positive reals there is exactly one y only and only one y right and exactly one y such that x times f of y plus y times f of x is less than equal to one is less than equal to two right so apart from the things that we discussed in this video use the idea of amgm that'll be one my that'll be just a hint that i'll give to you Maybe try employing AMGM over here as well. That might lead you to some interesting simplifications. So maybe give this a thought. Maybe give this at least one and a half to two hours before looking at a solution. Uh, this is a very small, it looks very simple question, but uh, you'll have to think about this quite a bit before going on to a solution. So maybe try this out. And if you're able to do it, let me know. Until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Chinta programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics. And they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training, individual evaluation, and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States, and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR, and IISC. For more information, visit chinta.com.